Now, there's our message from our speaker today, Brother James Walker. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me talk with Jesus and that will make everything all right. The songwriter says sometimes I may have doubts and fears. Sometimes I am overcome by that which I am anxious about. The songwriter says that I begin to allow tears to run from my eyes uncontrollably. He says, but just a little talk with Jesus will solve every single solitary problem that the human mind could ever come up with. Uh, I am overjoyed this morning to uh, be in your midst and to be in your presence, amen, to uh, be a part of this great gospel campaign and to be able to stand before you and declare unto you the whole counsel of God. Uh, I am in a little bit of trouble this morning. Uh, my wife has told me that I am soon to be placed on punishment. Uh, she already told me we're going to talk when we get in the car. So allow me to try to mitigate the damage by saying I'm so glad this morning to be accompanied by my better half. <laughs> Sister Denise Walker, I am uh, overjoyed. She goes with me everywhere. Uh, she has uh, been the greatest supporter ever uh, of my uh, career in the gospel. Uh, and I have to say that because the church has nicknamed us Pete and repeat. Wherever you find one, you find the other. Amen. 
Uh, and so I'm overjoyed uh, to have her with me. She is always uh, at the front and center of the amen corner. Amen. And, and so many times it's so easy to not mention that which we have become so accustomed to. Some things can become furniture to us. Y'all know what I'm saying? Because it's something that you depend on. You know, you don't count how many breaths you take during the day. You just depend on God's oxygen to be there. And for you to be able to have as much of it as you desire. Amen. Uh, and so it's one of those things where I think it's a preacher thing. I really do. I, I'm, I'm sharing something from the depths of my heart because silently we depend on our wives. We lean so heavily on our wives. Amen. And it becomes something that we don't get a chance to really articulate because while we're thinking about it, we're still leaning on them right then. Amen. And so it's so easy to not mention that which we depend on. Amen. See, we do the same thing with the Lord. Amen, brothers. I know some of y'all are smiling because y'all, some of y'all are thinking about this, too. You know, I do this, too. I better reach over and tell my wife something right now. Y'all better go on and say it now. I'm going to be the sacrificial lamb. Y'all experiment on me. I'm telling you now, tell your wife, thank you. Because if you have a wife that is faithful to the Lord, that has been supporting you in your work in the Lord, you have a true jewel. Amen. Uh, and this morning, I would like to invite your attention just for a few brief moments. Uh, now, it's 1115 exactly. I'm paying attention to the time. Amen. I already said I'm not going to preach an hour. Y'all heard me say that, right? Now, only three people laughed, and only three people believe me, amen? <laughs> the last three times I think I have preached an hour, I don't anticipate, even if it's 59 minutes, I'm not going to preach an hour. That was a joke. But anyway, <laughs> Psalms chapter 51 and verses number 10. And here you'll find the words of David. As he says, create in me a clean heart. O oh God, and renew a steadfast, or your older King James says, and renew a right spirit within me. It's not that it never existed. It's not that it's out of place, but rather I, I, I have a problem that I'm dealing with that only God can solve. We want to talk about this morning, just for a brief moment, the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is where we find the need for us to be rewired. I have been assigned the topic of rewired so that I can have a wonderful life with God. Now, who needs to have? A wonderful life with God. Everybody. The problem is, I'm coming down there now. I've been up here. Y'all have seen me. I've stood up. I've been seen. I've spoke up to be appreciated. Now I'm going to preach the gospel. Amen? Amen. The problem that we're having is that we do not necessarily self-identify with where we are. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that we are overly optimistic about our position with the Lord. What has happened is a culture has developed in the kingdom amongst our generation where we are forsaking the law of God while leaning on grace. Amen. Let me say that one more time. We are forsaking the law of God while leaning on grace, and we want to call it liberty. People are deviating from the word of God. They're deviating from the doctrine of God. They're deviating from the will of God in pursuit of their own will. So we ask ourselves, where did this come from? How does this develop? How does, how does a, a, a Christian, I'm going to start at home with us, amen? Uh, the Bible says if, if, if judgment should begin at the house of God, where shall the sinner and the ungodly appear? So I feel that the study and the correction should start at home. Amen. How am I going to go out in the world and convince anybody of anything and my business is raggedy? Amen. 
So in order for us to rewire, we first must assess where we are. Yes, I am baptized. I am a believer. I am in the kingdom. But at times, I can be a wet devil. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that at the heart of the matter is this. Everybody has a heart. But I don't want you to think about the heart that's pumping in your chest. I'm not talking about that one. See, if you take a five-gallon bucket, how do we know that it's a five-gallon bucket? I mean, really. Somebody at Home Depot can just give you an orange bucket. It might be four and a half gallons. How do you know it's a five-gallon bucket? You look at it, you size it up, but there's absolutely nothing that says this is a five-gallon bucket. You go to Lowe's, you see a similar bucket, it's blue. But there's nothing that says this is a five-gallon bucket. How do we know that it's a five-gallon bucket? Try to put five gallons of water in it. And let's see what it will hold. See, what happens is, let me tell you, let me tell you this story. Let me give you this illustration. Drinking a hot cup of tea. I love tea. My wife is the coffee person. I'm the tea person. And with this hot cup of tea adorned, somebody bumped my elbow while I'm drinking my hot tea. Now, what do y'all think happened? Y'all help me. What do you think happened? It spilled, right? Now, why did the hot tea spill? It didn't spill because somebody bumped my elbow. It spilled because the cup was shaken. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that whatever your heart is containing, we're going to Jeremiah the 18th chapter. Start looking for Jeremiah 18. And we're going to look at verses number 3 through 5. Because whatever your heart is containing is going to come out when you are shaken. So what happens with the heart, the heart of the vessel is the opening of the vessel. This is the depth of the vessel. This is what the vessel contains and what it has the ability to contain. That's the kind of heart. That's what identifies you. It's based on what you're able to hold and what you're able to handle. That's why Paul says, I can do all things. Through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Why? Because I have this mind in me or this heart in me, which also what was in Christ Jesus. So if I have a Christ-like heart, I can be a real Christian. I won't be a sometime -a Christian. I won't be a part-time Christian. Amen. I won't only come to church or come to worship and be in fellowship on Mother's Day, Father's Day. Y'all know what I'm saying. The Christian Reserve, one weekend a month, two weeks a year. Y'all know what I'm saying. Because what happens? I want to be John 4, 23 and 24, a true worshiper that God is looking for. So watch this. The heart. Hold your finger there with Jeremiah 18. Because what we're going to find out, the heart has four functions. There are four things that we're doing with our heart. And the first thing that we're doing, we're internalizing stuff. Amen. We're internalizing. And what's happening is the trauma, the drama that we have experienced, what we are doing is we are internalizing it. And when we internalize it, we begin to absorb it, and it is starting to become a part of us. You want to know why this is happening to us? You don't want to know why we've got to rewire this section of our heart? Do you know why God is claustrophobic in this part of our heart? It's because we don't want to let stuff out. Amen. We don't want to talk about stuff. You know, the last time I was here, I told us that what is happening is we, we have God under arrest. 
We have tied God's hands. We are just like the church of Laodicea. I am rich. I am increased in good. I don't need nothing when the whole time God is saying my strength is made perfect through your weakness. But we are so high and mighty. We so full of ourselves. We are so good. We don't need anything. So there's no room for God because we don't need anything. So watch this. We internalize. We begin to absorb. We've allowed it to become part of our anatomy. We, we, we've allowed it to become part of our psyche. And what happens when, when we internalize the pain, when we internalize the drama? What the Bible says in James chapter 5, verses number 15 and verses number 16, that what we are doing is we're doing the exact opposite of what we should be doing. Because James 5, 15 and 16 says what? Confess your faults that you may be healed. Wait a minute. You mean I got to talk about it? Yeah, you got to talk about it because you're not strong enough to carry it by yourself. Listen, the reason that you're pushing your friends away, the reason you're pushing your family away, the reason you're pushing your children away, the reason you're pushing your parents away, you're trying to carry some stuff that's too heavy for you. Amen. And we have gotten to the point that where we won't even talk to the Lord about it anymore. It's to the point that the Lord said, behold, I stand at the door and not Jesus has carpal tunnel because he's knocking at the door that you won't open. What's wrong with us? What's wrong with us? We're carrying a burden that we're not supposed to carry. We're carrying a burden that's supposed to let us see the necessity for God in our life. Matthew the 11th chapter, around about the 28th verse, he said, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Stop trying to solve your problems with money. You can't solve it with a house. You can't solve it with a car. You can't solve it with a new boyfriend. You can't solve it with a new girlfriend. You can't solve it with a divorce. You can only solve it with God and where we're fooling ourselves and wasting our lives and wasting our time we're trying to put everything else in God's place see after we internalize then we we start to do this other thing and this other thing is even more dangerous than internalizing and what we do is we rationalize. We try to make ourselves be okay with what we're doing. And this is dangerous because this is Satan's anesthetic. Mm -hmm. It numbs the pain of reality. And what happens when we rationalize, and, I, and what I want you to do, just, just crease that page in Jeremiah 18. I want to show you something. I'm going to do something with you real quick. I don't know if we did this the last time I was here. If, if, if you heard this before, if I, if I walked you through this before, just take more notes. But if you've never done this before, I, I want to show you something here. Genesis chapter 3, verses number 6, on one hand. On the other hand, it's going to be 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. And I want to show you what we do when we rationalize our situation, our condition, our trauma, and our drama. We, we're rationalizing the pain. We don't want to talk about it. We're holding it. We're carrying it. We're projecting it on other people. But we don't want to talk about it. I don't understand that. We do everything else with it, but talk about it. Ain't that something? The Bible says that if we confess our fault, no confession, no healing. And what happens is James draws a distinction and makes a very, very valid comparison between the fault and the sin. The sin is what you're doing. The sin is the after effect, but the fault is what's causing it. The car is overheating. That's the sin. The fault is that there's a hole in the radiator. Amen, Amen somebody. 
It's just that practical. It's just that easy. The problem is we are overlooking the fault and we keep repenting of the sin, coming right back with the same fault the same day. And we get stuck in this self-perpetuating cycle and we can't get out of it. We're trying to rationalize stuff. We're trying to make ourselves be okay with that which our conscience is denying us about. And so the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verses number 6, and when she saw the tree that it was good for food. See, that's somebody rationalizing. I know the law of God. I know what God said. God clearly said, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. That's what God said. I remember what God said because I told a serpent what God said. So it's not a fact of the matter of me not knowing the law of God. No, I know the word of God. I know the law of God. I know the will of God. The problem is I'm struggling between God's will and my will. That's the problem. And so what happens here is she said when she saw that the tree was good for food. Hmm. She saw that the tree was good for food. Flip over to 1 John 2, 16. That's called the lust of the eye. Excuse me, the lust of the flesh. Then you go back to Genesis 3. Not only was the tree good for food, but it was also what else? A tree desired to make, oh wait, it was pleasing to the eye. That's the second thing. It was pleasing to the eye. She saw that it was good for food, the lust of the flesh, and that it was pleasing to the eye, the lust of the eye. First John 2, 16, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye. Then it was a tree desired to make one wise, the pride of life. Do you see how easy this is? Do you see how this works? Satan is pulling the wool over our eyes every day because we won't look twice. All God said was, don't eat the fruit of this tree. Now, all the other trees in the garden, you can pick them till you pick them clean. But this one, leave it alone. And out of all the trees in the garden, the only tree that received this type of consideration is the one that God said, don't go near. Y'all see how we rationalize sin in our minds? Now watch this. After this takes place, her son is going to kill her baby. Read it for yourself. See, what happens is what we allow in our heart gets projected on our family even. Because of this action, sin has now been introduced into the world after she rationalized what it was that she desired over what God said. Now her husband's in on it. She took of the fruit. She did eat and gave it. Also, do you see how we include other folks in it? We need to be rewired because what's happening is we are tearing up not only our lives, we're tearing up the lives of other people too. There's some things that we got to solve after we have internalized it. After we have rationalized it, then we start to idolize it. And what happens is we we fall in love with image. We we, we fall in love with with, with how something looks, the, the presentation of the whole thing. And what happens is we start lying to ourselves. Let me ask you now, sisters, I'm sorry, I I got to pick on y'all just a little bit. Have y'all ever found that pair of shoes that you just had to have but they didn't have them in your size but you had to have those shoes and so you went on and bought them anyway because those are the shoes that you wanted to have those shoes went perfectly with your outfit with your purse with your hat everything right it completed the ensemble and what happened you were willing to walk in pain 
Because you had to have that because of how you feel about it. And guess what? This is what we do. We will walk the Christian path in pain trying to look some kind of way. Because we are not willing to allow God to do his work. So David says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew or revive a right spirit within me. Now, I, I, I don't want to just be patched up. See, David is very, very specific with his request. You know, now you and I, now we like to patch stuff up. You know, now, I, you know, I will patch tires. I, I have patched a pair of boots. I, I once patched the baptismal boots at church once, but don't tell nobody I said that. I mean, I had a tire patch some glue. We had to use the boots that we had, amen? And Brother Walker can't swim, so we had to come up with something. But some things don't need to be patched. Now, we did buy some new boots after that, just so y'all know. But what, am I, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying David is specific with his request. He said, create, create. See, there are some things that I have allowed in my heart that are contaminating the whole vessel. See, the heart is the opening. The heart is the depth. The heart is the interior volume of the vessel. And so he says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So what? What David is asking God for is what Jeremiah was blessed to see. And so Jeremiah, it, it said the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And the Bible tells me that he said, go down to the potter's house. Jeremiah goes down to the potter's house and the potter is working with clay on the wheels. And the problem that the potter is having is that the vessel that he's making is broken in his hands. And so what the potter does is the potter takes the broken clay and he just reforms it. He reshapes it. He, he, he reaches down into the vessel with his hand and he begins to reshape it and when he reshapes it he can enlarge in the heart of the vessel but did you know at the same time the potter is also reaching in and removing some material from the inside of the vessel see it's still on the wheels it's still clay it's still moldable it's still malleable you've got to be willing to let God work with you You've got to be willing to let God reach in your heart and take some stuff out. There were some folk that died because they wouldn't let some stuff out. Amen. Acts chapter 5, verses number 23, I heard Peter tell Ananias and Sapphira, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You, you, you're willing, you're willing to lie to God because you allowed Satan to fill yeah. your heart. Yeah. Matthew chapter 15. Jesus says that the things that flow from the heart, anger, murders, envy, how do these things flow from the heart? Because Proverbs 4 and 23 told us to guard our hearts. There's some things that we have let in and they are contaminating us. And they are changing our actual design. They are turning us into the person that God did not create. That's where we're having our downfall. It's because they are changing us into something that... Second Timothy chapter two, I believe it's verse number 26. I'm going on memory. Watch this. I, 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 I'll show you exactly what it's doing when it contaminates the vessel. Second Timothy chapter two. Run over there with me real quick, please. This is this is how the process works. This is exactly what happens. And preachers, elders, deacons, uh, th th this is this is where we th this is where we are needed the most. In our ministries, amen. 
2 Timothy chapter 2. The Bible says in verses number 22, flee also youthful lust. Don't try to struggle with it. What did the Bible say? Flee. That means avoid. See, there's some stuff you're supposed to struggle with and overcome, and then there's some stuff you're just supposed to avoid. There are some things to just stay away from. Because this is in a particular season. Young people, this is your part right here. Flee youthful lust. Why? Because in our youth, we are not strong enough. We don't have the experience to stand there and fight. It's not what we know and what we don't know. It's what we've experienced and what we haven't. And so because of the fact that we have not yet experienced it, stay away from it. Avoid it. There are other things for you to do with your youth. Matter of fact, here's the easy one. Remember the creator in the days of thy youth, but flee youthful lust. The next part he says, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a what kind of heart? A pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, and in humility, correcting those, here it is, who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. Here it is. Having been taken captive by him at his will. That's what Satan's trying to get you to do. Satan is trying to get you to accomplish his will. That's why we need to be rewired. Because the way that Satan is going to try to get you to accomplish his will, he's going to dangle everything in front of you to distract you, to deter you, and to pull you away from the Lord. So the rewiring process is an internal process. We've got to let God work from the inside out. Stop trying to treat the issue from the outside in. Humanistically, what we want to do is we want to just make ourselves feel better about what's going on. So what we do is we get all the stuff on the outside to make us feel better. Usually you go down to the dealership, you buy a new car, you instantaneously feel better. You do. It's got that new car smell. It looks good. It sounds good. It rides smooth. You've forgotten about all your problems until you get out of the car. Or after 45 days when you get the first car payment, when you get that bill in the mail, and then all of a sudden you remember that you just added this bill to all the other unpaid bills that you have been struggling with. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that we try to use outside forces to treat inside deficiencies. So the rewiring process, the restructuring process, the repair process, he said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Because our joy and our happiness is not about what's on the outside. It's about what God has put on the inside. See, a broken heart, a broken mind, a broken spirit, all from the same problem, internal structural deficiency. The Christian is crumbling from within. That's what the Bible is teaching us. And that's where the rewiring process needs to take place. The first thing that we got to do is we got to allow God to separate us from some stuff. And see, where we struggle humanistically is we struggle emotionally. And the reason why we struggle emotionally is because we have feelings about what it is that God needs to remove from us. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. Sometimes we, 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 we've got a problem cutting off family members. Amen. We love them. 
But sometimes your family members, your friends, amen, your acquaintances, sometimes the people you hang out with at lunchtime at work, whoever it is, they are pulling you away from the Lord because they're causing you to behave as somebody that you are not. And the energy that should be investing in your development is now going into being who you aren't. And so what happens is we love them. They're cool. We want to hang out with them. We want to be friends with them. We want to be close to them. And when God is pulling you away, you are latched on. And now you want to get mad with God because God is trying to pull you to where you ought to be. But I I guarantee you this. I promise you this one thing. Whatever you sacrifice for the cause of Christ and to the Lord, the Lord will restore tenfold. And the Lord will restore it better with something that you had that you've never had before. The Lord will restore it with something greater than what you've sacrificed. That's what I want you to understand. But the Bible says that you have to be willing in order to do it. See, we use this scripture all the time for giving, but it applies to every corner of the Christian life. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verses number six and verses number seven. And this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. See, I don't want to give up nothing out of my life. I want to hold on to all of my wills. I want to hold on to all my desires. I still want to go to the club on Saturday night. I still want to get drunk with my friends. I still want to smoke weed. I still want to snort cocaine. I still want to do all of those things that I know God says I can't do. But I'll be there at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, Brother Walker. Don't worry about it. I'll see you next Sunday. The whole time. The Lord is looking at us. And the Lord is saying. I wish that you would either be hot or be cold. He said, but be you lukewarm. I will spew thee out of my mouth. What God is saying is God is saying that your indecisiveness. Is sickening. That's hard language. But that's the honest truth. That's the Lord saying, I'm just being honest with you. The Lord is saying that, you know what, I wish at this point that you would just make up your mind. Either you are with me or you're against me. I've always been for you. I've always been in your corner. But I need you to make up your mind to be on my side. That's what the Lord is saying to us. And so in Revelation, the third chapter, he says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Revelation 3, starting about verse 14. And what he's saying, he's saying that we have convinced ourselves and we have misled ourselves. And so the gold tried in the fire is faith. If we're going to be rewired, if we're going to be reprogrammed, if we're going to be redeveloped, if we're going to reach our full potential in Christ, if we're going to stop wasting the blood of Christ and wasting our time on this earth, then we're going to have to have the faith to let God lead us. And I don't mean lead you where God allows or where where you allow God to lead you. No, I mean to let God lead you. When we let things go and we stop worrying about certain things and then when we look back, we notice that the Lord already solved it and we didn't even notice that the Lord had solved it. You were walking down the street on a cloudy day and then the sun came out and you couldn't remember what the cloudy sky looked like anymore. Y'all remember that? That's what I'm talking about. Because that's the change that the Lord makes when we allow the Lord to lead. You don't even remember what it was you were struggling for. In John chapter 6, the disciples were rowing a boat. Twelve disciples in a boat trying to get where they're trying to get to on the other side. Couldn't get there. They're rowing against the wind. Twelve men with paddles and oars and they're all rowing. And they're in one spot not going anywhere. But you know what the Bible says? The second that Jesus stepped on board immediately. Read it for yourself. It's right there. When they let Jesus on board, when Jesus stepped on board the boat, immediately they were at the land whether they went. That's the difference. We're wasting our time fighting for no reason. Let Jesus on board. Immediately. They were already there. John chapter 6. That's the same chapter where the 5,000 were fed. That's the same chapter where, where, where the people who were fed then turned and said, we can't deal with this type of teaching and preaching. We're going back home. 
Why? Because you want what you want, not what God wants for you. Amen. And where they're standing at that point in their walk, God wants it for them more than they want it for themselves. Rewired. I want to walk with the Lord. I don't want to keep walking contrary to the Lord. So David says, create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. What happens in Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, is all the broken pieces of the clay get reformed and reshaped. And a new vessel is made with a new heart. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. If you are here this morning and you are subject to the invitation, you come to God by hearing and believing the gospel. Acts chapter 15, verses 7. After you've heard and believed the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. They combine to make what is called the saving power of God. Romans chapter 1, verses 16. After you've heard and believed the gospel, you should be willing to repent of your sins. Are you ready to change your mind? Are you ready to change your way? Are you ready to change your action? Are you ready to just make the first step? Are you ready to start trusting the Lord? The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse number 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. After you repented of your sins, you should be willing to confess or acknowledge that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Romans chapter 10, verses number 10, With the heart, Man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. After I've made that great and grand confession, the last step is water baptism. The Bible says in Acts chapter 22 and verses number 16, Now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, washing away thy sin, calling on the name of the Lord. Let me tell you this one thing. A baby cannot call for his mother or his father before he's born. I want, you to, I want to let that soak in. The baby cannot cry. The baby cannot ask for milk. The baby cannot, nothing, no interaction. So as long as you stand a guilty distance from God outside of Christ, you have no access to prayer. You have no access to salvation. You have no access to redemption. Why? Because you haven't been born. Look at what the scripture said. Washing away thy sin, calling on the name of the Lord. You cannot call before birth. When the spirit and the water come together, a Christian is born every time. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Ask Nicodemus because Jesus explained it to him. How can a man be born when he is old? Except a man be born of the water and of the spirit. The spirit, the water, and the blood bear witness on the earth. 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 16. So if you are here this morning and you are subject to the invitation, Maybe if you are here this morning and you are a Christian already, but you have erred from the path, maybe, maybe something that we've said, maybe something we've uncovered this morning has turned a light bulb on. Don't let the light go out. The light is on. Do something with the light. Stop coming to church service and worship service and hearing the word of God preached passionately by the servants of the Lord. And then you let it go in one ear out of the other and it never resonates in your heart and you never do anything with it. Because I got a sad surprise for you. If you do this all of your life. On the day of judgment, John chapter 12, verses 48 says the same word. Which was spoken unto you. Shall judge you in the last day. What are you going to do? With what you have received. We need to be rewired. And guess what? The lights will come on. And you will be a city that is set on a hill. That cannot be hid. If you are here this morning and you are subject to the invitation, will you come as we stand and sing the song of encouragement?